Welcome. This video is intended to be a summer review for those of you who are going into Algebra 1. So we would assume that you have already taken pre-algebra and are going into Algebra 1. And these are kind of the key concepts that your Algebra 1 teacher is hoping that you will know and know really well so that the whole class can have an, a good even start to the year. So the first thing here is operations with integers. When you are adding integers together, if they're the same sign, you add them together and keep the sign that they have. If they're different signs, you subtract and keep the sign of the larger number. There's a cool rhyme for that actually that I almost said because I just can't help it. Um, so we want to look at number one and say negative one plus negative six. So we're adding two things that are both negative and that means that together they will make something more negative. Negative one plus negative six is negative seven. You can think about operations with integers like adding and subtracting using a number line and that can be helpful or you can think about it like uh, money that if you're in debt a dollar and you go in debt more by six dollars then you'll now be more in debt at seven dollars or thinking about it like um, a negative team and a positive team there's lots of different options there so if you're struggling at the end of this with understanding how to do operations with integers definitely go and look up more about that because um, it's really really important in algebra one that you're not struggling with this concept number two we are subtracting so 8 minus 3, that's just like a normal subtraction problem, which is great. 8 minus 3 is 5, and it's a positive 5 because the 8 was positive and is the bigger number of the two. 6 minus 7, when we subtract, we, we do subtraction like normal. We'd say 7 minus 6 and get 1, but it's a negative 1 because the 7 was the bigger number and is negative. I guess another way... Like the way I think of this is to actually think of it like an addition problem. Subtraction is just fancy addition where we have taken out the plus sign. So if you think about it this way and this is easier, when I do six plus a negative seven, I've subtract them, but I keep the sign of the bigger number, which was the seven. And that's how I get negative one. When we're multiplying or dividing, it all depends on how many negatives we have. So having a number that's positive and a number that's negative turns the whole thing negative. Whereas having two numbers that are negative, they, the negatives cancel each other out and make a positive. It's kind of like in English, whenever you have a double negative, how it makes your sentence have a positive meaning. Like, I don't need no math. Yeah, I don't need no math. Well, you've got, you've got two negatives there, and that shows that you really do need math and probably also English, if that's something that happens to you often. So. Two negatives cancel to make a positive, but one negative makes your answer negative overall, and that's for multiplication and division. So six times negative nine, six times nine is 54, but our answer is negative because one of them was negative. Negative three times negative seven, since they're both negative, our answer is 21. 63 divided by negative seven is nine, but is negative because one of our answers was negative. And negative 90 divided by negative 10, the negatives cancel each other out and make a positive 9. If you didn't remember how to do all of those by yourself, then you definitely should, either with a friend or a parent or sibling or the internet, find more problems to do uh, to do more practice. And if necessary, look up more about how to do them because it's just so important that you know how to do this at the start of Algebra 1. And if you didn't know and you just looked at the video to find out how to do it. That's not really enough practice to make sure you've got the hang of it. All right, these next few we have are testing our order of operations. So we use an acronym for order of operations called PEMDAS. And so each of these letters stands for something. So P is for parentheses. Which is a super long word. E is for exponents. M is for multiplication. And D is for division. A is for addition. 
and S is for subtraction. And the key thing here that people will forget is that multiplication happens at the same time left to right and addition and subtraction is actually supposed to happen at the same time left to right. So you do not do multiplication before division if that's all you have left. If all you have left is multiplication and division, you do it in order from left to right. Same with addition and subtraction. So we want to do parentheses first on 8 because we have parentheses and then we're going to say 1 plus 1 is 2. So if you thought the days of 1 plus 1 were over, here we've got a, a set of, or a question that asks us that. 1 plus 1 is 2. So we're going to do 4 divided by 2, which gives us 2 as our answer. So parentheses first. Number 9, this is an example of addition and subtraction all in the same problem where we don't want to choose to do the addition first because it's first in PEMDAS. We actually want to choose it first because it's the first thing that we come across. We want to do 6 plus 4 and get 10, and then we want to subtract 3 and get 7 because we go in order from left to right. Probably would have been better to have this switched around a little bit better if, if, if I was trying to trick you, that is, which of course I'm not. It would be a situation where... Okay, so like what I'm saying is if the question was was this instead, you wouldn't do 4 plus 3 first. You would do 6 minus 4 first and get 2 and then add 3 and get 5. So um, you do left from right. The other idea is to just think of it as plus a negative 4 and then you can do it in whatever order you want to. And that's also an option. Okay, number 10 says 3 times 2 squared. We've got parentheses and an exponent and multiplication. The parentheses go first. So we do 3 times 2, which is 6. And then we square the 6, and we get 36 as our answer. Uh, 11. You might think about trying some of these on your own if you think that they're going well. You can pause the video and then skip ahead to see the answer. Go back and get the expl explanation if you need it. So parentheses first, so 5 plus 6 is 11, and we times that by 2, and we get 22. And then number 12, we've got 4 times 5, which is 20. That has to happen, that multiplication, before we add them together. So 4 times 5 is 20, 20 plus 3 is 23. Now let's solve some simple equations. So there are a couple ways to do this whenever we have equations that are this simple. You probably actually did some harder equations than this in, in pre-algebra, but we're starting off with simple ones. One way to do this is to think in your head, like, well, what do I times negative 20 by to get negative 40? The other way is to use our properties of equality that say, well, if I'm doing negative 20 times V, if I divide by negative 20, that'll make that turn into a 1, and that makes me also do it to the other side so that I end up with 1v, which is what I want in order to know what v equals, and then I do negative 40 divided by negative 20, which is a positive 2, and that's my answer. If you did it in your head, you'd get the same thing, right? You'd say, oh, negative 20 times 2 equals negative 40. So that's our algebraic reasoning for y v equals 2. And there's a way to do that on each of these. So you might be able to think what plus 19 equals 0, just fine. The other way to do it is to say I'm going to subtract 19 from both sides. So p equals 0 minus 19 is negative 19. And on these, if you are solving it using your algebraic properties, you can always go back and check it, or either way you can check it by actually saying, okay, if I put the negative 19 where p is, negative 19 plus 19, does that give me zero? Yes, it does. So that would be cr the correct answer. Number 15, um, so we subtracted 19 on 14 because it was a plus 19. Here it's a minus 20, so I would want to add the 20 over 
This is especially a case where if you're trying to do what minus 20 equals negative 31, you might get stuck because of the negative number. So if I do it this way instead, if I think negative 31 plus 20, I would subtract those two numbers and then it would still be negative because the 31 is bigger and is negative. So that would give me negative 11. All right, so on 16, we have a fraction here. So maybe you find it easy to say what divided by four equals negative 20, or maybe we wanna think because we're dividing by four, the opposite of that is to multiply by a regular four or a four over one so that we can cancel out the four. So then we'd have to do the same thing on this side, which negative 20 times four over one is the same as just saying negative 20 times four. So that means n equals negative 80. So really solving one step equations or equations in general, it's about undoing to the variable what's already been done to it in the problem. So instead of adding, subtracting, instead of multiplying, dividing, and so on. Let's see what's next. Drawing inequalities. So we don't have to do any solving here. We just need to go over the way that we draw graphs for inequalities. And so there's a cool trick we can do here where if we have a variable on the left, then the inequality actually kind of points us the direction we want to, to draw our inequality. So for instance, if I want to draw x is less than or equal to negative six, I'm gonna put a dot at negative six, which is over here. And I'm actually gonna make that dot be filled in because it says less than or equal to. So filling in the dot shows that negative six could be what x equals. And then I want to shade all the numbers that are more negative than negative six. So not less than negative, not not the positive numbers, I want to shade the more negative numbers. So I'm gonna shade this to the left on this graph. Um, so negative six and to the left. Those are all the numbers that x could be, is negative six and anything left of negative six. If it's not equal to, like on 18, I'm gonna put an open circle. So at negative two here, I'm gonna put a circle that's not filled in and then I want to think if it's greater than negative two, which direction is that? Is zero greater than negative two? Is five greater than negative two? Or is negative six greater than negative two? Well, it's these numbers that are to the right of negative two. So I would shade this direction to show which way my answers are. And so you can kind of think of this like a little arrow pointing us the direction that we want to shade. But that trick only works if the variable is on the left side. If it's on the right, um, then it doesn't work. On 19, b is greater than or equal to negative 1. We want to put a dot at negative 1, and we want that dot to be filled in because it is equal to. So filling it in means, yes, my answer can be negative 1. We're on 18. We didn't fill it in, so negative 2 is not something that k can be because it's not equal to. It has to be greater than negative 2. So that's what the difference is there. Now we're shading numbers that are greater than negative one, which are the numbers that are this direction. And then number 20, x is less than four. We wanna put an open circle at four to show that it, our answer can't be four. And then we wanna shade the numbers that are smaller than four or more negative than four, which is things like three, two, one, and so on. So that's gonna to shade to the left. It's beautiful shading happening right here. I always tell my students to make sure that you um, shade things at least as well as I do and then do fun things like that where it's like, well, that was, that was mediocre. All right. 21 through 24, simplify by adding like, ter like terms and or using the distributive property. So we want to check to see if there are things that can go together or um, if we've got parentheses, we're gonna use the distributive property. So here on 21, if you have 6v minus eight and plus nine, 
then you can't put the 6V and the negative 8 and the plus 9 all together, but you can put part of them together because a negative 8 and a positive 9 are two things that go together because they're regular numbers. Negative 8 plus 9 is a positive 1. So the 6V doesn't change, and we just change these two numbers together to make plus 1. On the other hand, on 22, we have 1 plus 8 and plus 2 in. Now our like terms are the 8 in and the 2 in. And so think of it as um, like if you had apples, that you have 8 apples plus 2 apples. Together, those are going to make 10 apples. And so we'd put 10 in because we have 10 of them. The 1 can't add to the 10 apples because the 1 does not have the same. You can think of it kind of like units. 1 is not in the same grouping. Maybe 1 is representing oranges or something. So we can't add the 1 into our group that is only apples. We have to leave it separate. So it's plus 1. 10 in plus 1. The distributive property is that property that says multiply everything on the inside by that thing that's on the outside. So 2 times negative 5n is negative 10n, and 2 times 3 is 6. And just like on our previous two, how we didn't add the variables with the regular numbers, these don't combine because you can't combine an n with something that does not have an n. So that would be our answer. On 24, distributive property again, we're going to multiply negative 4 and x and get negative 4x. Negative 4 times negative 7, those are two negatives, so they make a positive 28. Again, if you feel like you understand that now but didn't when you started and had to watch the video, you might think about finding some more examples of this to go over instead of just trusting that like now magically you have it. Um, if, I mean, your, your parents or your siblings or friends can probably help you come up with some extra examples to use on that. All right, we've got some operations with fractions. So fractions uh, are still a thing. And if we're adding or subtracting fractions, we need common denominators. We don't need common denominators when we multiply or divide. When we divide, we have to flip the second fraction. These are all rules that will always be the case. It's just that once you get to Algebra 1 or even pre-algebra and certainly on, not every single problem has fractions. And so if you're not doing fractions on a daily basis, sometimes it's hard to remember how to do it. So you want to get these things stuck in your head that on addition and subtraction, we need a common denominator. So 4 and 3, we need we can make this be 12 if we multiply this by 3 and this one by 4. So that gives us 9 over 12 and 4 over 12. And the reason we're doing this is we can't take 3 fourths and subtract 1 third and and have it make sense. Like we need things that are, have the same denominator, almost like we're having like terms. Because now that they have 12, we're saying if you have 9 twelfths and you subtract 4 twelfths, how many twelfths do you have? So that gives us 5 twelfths. You check to see if this will simplify it all, which it will not, and you box it and that's your answer. Oh, 26 is interesting. We have a mixed number and we have one that's not a mixed number. We do not have common denominators. So we could go about this more than one way. I need a common denominator, which I'm gonna get 15 for my common denominator. So that gives me 25 over 15 plus three, which that three in front doesn't change at all by me multiplying this other part of my fraction by three. So that gives us this. So 25 fifteenths plus 12 fifteenths gives me 37 fifteenths. And we've still got this big three here. And so we would want to then say, well, 37 is bigger than 15, so we need to change this into a better mixed number than it is. 15 goes into 37 twice, so this should really be five. And it goes into it twice because it, we can get it to be 30, 37 minus 30 is 7, so our new numerator is 7. So the other way we could have gone about that 
is we could have started off by changing this to a mixed number or this to an improper fraction so that they were both um, the same kind of fraction. And maybe you would find that easier, maybe not. Um, so something something like that. One of those one of those different ways of doing it, you should still end up with the same thing. We still have to get common denominators. Um, at some point, we're having to change between mixed numbers and improper fractions one direction or the other. And so we should get 5 and 7 fifteenths. As, a, as an improper fraction, let's see, that would be, I think, 82 over 15. So if that's how you did it and you're wondering if it's right, that would be the equivalent improper fraction. 27, we're multiplying. So when you multiply fractions, you do top and top together and bottom and bottom together. But if you notice that there are things on top and bottom that cancel, you can start off by doing that. For instance, 12 and 2 are both divisible by 2, so we can make that change. And that gives us smaller numbers to work with. Sometimes that it makes the problem like the difference between being really, really difficult and frustrating and super easy. If you didn't do that, if you did 12 over 14, what's going to happen is you can simplify that and you absolutely should simplify fractions anytime you can to something like six over seven, the smallest thing possible. When you're dividing fractions, the difference is that the second fraction needs to flip and then we turn it into a multiplication problem. So I start off by flipping the one half and making it two over one. And then I can do the same thing I did on 27 where I look for things that cancel, like a 2 out of 10 and 2. And that gives me 13 times 1 on top and 5 times 1 on bottom, which is 13 fifths. As a, it doesn't reduce into a smaller fraction, but I can change this to a mixed number. 5 goes into 13 twice to get 10, and that leaves 3 left over. So my answer would be 2 and 3 fifths. Now, a couple of final things to go over. Graphing points. So when you graph points, the first number is your x and the second number is your y. This is your x-axis. This is your y-axis. So you move left or right first, and then you move up and down second. So moving left or right, it's right when it's positive, and we've got numbers marked here to help us remember on this graph. But if you're making your own graph, you need to think to the right is positive, just like we do number lines, and then up for y is positive. So 3 comma 1, I want to go right 3 and up 1. Negative 5 comma 6, we want to go left 5 and up 6. Negative 4, negative 2, so left 4, down 2. And 1, negative 7, so right 1 and down 7. So there are my four points. And then 30, when we are square rooting something, that has to do with the idea of thinking what times what equals the number underneath, where these have to be the same thing. So 5 times 5 equals 25. So the square root of 25 is 5. What times what gives you 64? It would be 8 times 8. So the square root of 64 is 8. Then these last two, these straight lines, are absolute value bars. Absolute value bars are, are talking about the distance something is from zero on the number line. And so what it essentially does is it makes whatever inside, whatever's inside positive. So the absolute value of positive 6 is 6, but the absolute value of negative 6 is also positive 6. So just whatever it is that you have inside, if there's multiple things, you work it out. And then whatever is left at the end, the very end, you absolute value it, and it changes to a positive. So this has been a review of some concepts that were in pre-algebra, hopefully, that you will it will be helpful for you to know at the start of Algebra 1, or some of these things maybe are more helpful later on in Algebra 1. But this is a brief overview of that. If there's anything that you struggled on, make sure to look for some extra help um, using other resources on the internet, like YouTube, which has lots of educational videos, and good luck.